Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Greg Blaney. After a stint teaching at Michigan State, Greg Blaney moved to Vancouver, British Columbia and pursued a clinical practice focused on chronic pain. Dr. Blaney. Uh, thank you for um, inviting me to come to this uh, prestigious conference. Um, I'm kind of a unique um, um, being because I'm a clinician. I'm not um, a researcher. I'm not an academic. Um, but I have been involved in clinical practice uh, for too many years. And um, the last 20 plus has been dealing with chronic pain patients. And um, I'm a, a Mac guy, so I have to give me a little pause because I'm working with a PC. And in chronic pain patients, um, chronic pain manifesting most of the time in muscle skeletal pain, but also in neurological pain, discogenic pain, etc. cetera. Um, in that uh, population of patients, there is a number of comorbid conditions. Um, it is very common um, to find chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, interstitial cystitis, prostatitis, sinusitis, periodontal disease, um, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, uh, hypertension, renal calculi, um, uh, cholelithiasis, and various cognitive um, um, and central nervous system disorders. Um, and they can be a challenge. Now, in trying to find a way to support my patients in their chronic pain, there's a, a fairly limited um, number of tools. Um, in terms of fibromyalgia, muscle skeletal pain, you know, we have biomechanical factors, uh, we have fitness factors, but other than that, we're really you know, working with either muscle relaxants, um, NSAIDs, um, now we've got Neurontin, Lyrica, um, and, but a, a variable um, if effectiveness, and of course, often will have side effects and will actually aggravate some of the comorbid conditions. So in my kind of endeavors to try and discover what may be going on with this patient cohort, um, I started looking into both infective and inflammatory potential causations. And so first thing that comes up, is, as you all know, is that the concept of infection presenting as a non-infectious disease. This has been discussed for many, many decades. And at this moment in time, certainly recently, adult onset asthma now is being seen as um, a manifestation of a persistent infection. Interstitial cystitis is, more, is seen now more and more as being a persistent um, biofilm infection of the bladder. Um, certainly recurrent cystitis now is recognized as being a persistent infective disorder. Irritable bowel, um, chronic sinusitis, gingivitis, um, periodontal disease. Um, recently there's been a finding of, of increased bacterial load present in women who either miscarry or have premature labor. Um, sarcoidosis has been implicated as being caused by a bacterial infection and macular degeneration with chlamydia trachomoda as being a pot potential causative agent. Now we also find that there is a persistent inflammatory condition going on in, my, in chronic pain patients. And this is a recent quote from Nature 2008 which basically describes this type of inflammation as a para-inflammation para um, which is uh, uh, expressed or uh, uh, arising from resident macrophage dysfunction. Now, the other thing that's been coming up again is, is like in medicine, things go through cycles. And the cycle now is, is this reawakening of an interest in persistent and chronic uh, infections. And this is again a recent publication where it states the um, various um, aspects of bacteria, both in their nature as well as their ability to evade the immune system, as becoming more and more recognized as. Um, a problem and 
In terms of bacteria, we're now looking at and recognizing that they have a colony type of pattern and they also have quorum consciousness. And so that you can almost think of them as like a beehive. We've got the worker bees, we've got the active bacteria, we've got bacteria in that same colony that are designated persister cells, and we also have part of that bacterial load that are in dormant or in very low metabolic rate. And the other thing that's interesting is that it has been speculated that over 99% of all the species that are present in the environment fail to grow in laboratory uh, medium. They also grow very slow, like tuberculosis bacteria. And so if you're looking for a, a pathogen in a, urine, in a bladder infection, a uh, chronic recurring bladder infection, and you do a 24 or 48 hour culture, uh, you may not pick up any significant colony growth and you will have a report coming back that you have no infection. Also, because the adaptive immune system is not functioning very well, it's more an inflammatory condition, that same year analysis will come back as negative for leukocytes. Now, this is really following up in terms of Dr. Marshall's presentation. So there I am, I'm, in a, I'm a clinician. I have a significant number of people who are not functioning very well who are dependent on medications that have, are not very effective and have significant side effects and adverse effects. And in terms of some of the more recent drugs, the biologicals uh, have a, a significant economic um, um, load on their finances. So in researching this out, this hypothesis that um, Dr. Marshall uh, as uh, stated, which I learned about about five years ago, and that hypothesis was, was there a possibility that one of the ways the bacteria persists in the body is that it's able to sabotage the innate immune response, and because, interestingly enough, there seems to be um, a, a pathological calcification component to a lot of these conditions, and relates to vitamin D metabolism and now as we know the nuclear, the nuclear VDR is very important in terms of innate immune response that this VDR could become hyper responsive through some mechanism that the bacteria has learned how to do. So I did my own unfunded study which is I took a hundred of my patients um, and the breakdown was basically out of that 130 of them were documented autoimmune diseases, um, 42 of them were chronic uh, uh, fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and the rest were some metabolic syndrome and there was some um, what's called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome um, patients basically people who've had some event where they were infected with a zoonotic infection that was treated or not treated and had persistent symptoms afterwards. And what I did is I basically measured their serum levels for 25 um, hydroxyvitamin D, 125 di um, dihydroxyvitamin D, CRP, which is a, a phase one um, a protein, CK, which I have found in my interest in muscle skeletal medicine was often elevated, uh, and ferritin. And what I found was is that the most sensitive uh, or the most consistent finding was a finding of an elevation of the 125 uh, hydroxyvitamin D. I used the cutoff point of 110 picomole per liter. Um, if you want to convert that into American uh, terminology, feel free to. You divide by 2.4. Um, and I use that level because that is kind of the consensus as the, um, the high normal for 125D. Uh, some researchers have put it at 130, which is when you'll start seeing hypercalcemia. But in my, it, there's not a lot out there in terms of normal values for 125 uh, hydroxy D, dihydroxy D, but that's the best one I came up with. Uh, and the ranges were anywhere from 110 up to 350 picomoles per liter, which is exceptionally high, with no hypercalcemia, interestingly enough. The 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which I put as deficiency of less than 50 nanomoles, which I think is pretty well an agreed-upon uh, determination of deficiency state, 
Only 26 of those 100 patients had that uh, finding with a range between 20 and 49 nanomoles per liter. CRP was positive in 17 out of the 100 patients, elevated CK was positive in about 12, and elevated ferritin was positive in only four of that 100 patients. So interpretation, well, interpretation was is that elevated levels of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D above 110 was a pretty sensitive and consistent indicator of um, in this small cohort of patients uh, with autoimmune disease and autoimmune associated diseases. At the time I did this, chronic fatigue syndrome was not seen as an autoimmune type disease. It was certainly evidence was suggesting that there was altered immunity, um, but it wasn't put into that category, it now is. And this does suggest the fact that there is the presence of vitamin D receptor hyporesponsiveness. And again, I'm a clinician. One that points out for me, or that stands out for me, is type 2 diabetes, where there is a, uh, an increased resistance to insulin, and one of the manifestations of that is an elevation in insulin levels in the early phases of type 2 diabetes, and is only later if, even if it does occur where the, the insulin levels start dropping, which interestingly enough is what we find in some of our chronic um, uh, patients with chronic disease like the, that we're t talking about. So again, clinician, I went, well, if this is the case, maybe we should try and do something about their condition and, and use a treatment. And so using the information developed by Dr. Marshall and also doing the research into angiotensin receptor blockers and how they are now being increasingly used for non-antihypertensive um, conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis where they're using 10 milligram per kilogram levels of, of balsartan in one study um, also being used um, in research in terms of metastatic cancer again in 10 milligram per kilogram dosages uh, with no, uh, no, no toxic effects. So we used Olmosartan which because of uh, modeling, um, molecular modeling information as well as uh, clin um, patient response, uh, we used Olmosartan even though you can use some of the other ARBs and we used them in doses of 40 milligrams every six to eight hours. And with the, main, with the main intention of reducing angiotensin II pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are implicated in a lot of these conditions, such as atherosclerosis, um, um, many of those comorbid conditions. It also, as indicated by modeling, has a VDR agonistic effect and this is confirmed clinically because that when you use Olmosartan in a significant number of patients, they show symptoms of immune activation, which we call immunopathology, and sometimes will even express to the point where it will be very similar to iris, so-called immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome that is seen in AIDS patients with um, high-dose HAART. Then we went at the infective component. We used bacterial static antibiotics um, of a variety of type. And we initiate with one of them initially. And then after we build up to a certain level of doses with that, we add a second. Clindamycin in particular is interesting because not, it has an amplification effect of other antibiotics when given in concert with other antibiotics. We start with fairly significant low doses, 25 milligrams minocycline, typically every 48 hours. Um, azithromycin, we can start with 25 milligrams every 10 days. Uh, the reason for that is, as you know, azithromycin has a very long half-life, 60 hours, and has very good tissue penetration and stays in the tissues for a long time. Um, the intention of using these low-dose sub-inhibitory levels of antibiotics is to reduce the bacterial virulence factors. Um, again, this is something that's been shown in the research, that if you use low-dose antibiotics, you don't kill the ba uh, bacteria and therefore you don't induce resistance or dormancy or persister cells, but you do reduce the ability of them to um, avoid uh, uh, the immune system response and to persist. 
Um, it also, we use it in a pulsed manner because in that way there is not a consistent environment of antibiotic uh, concentrations, which again will have a tendency to, or have effectively reduce the development of mutant uh, resistant strains. And at dosages that are obviously a very low or no toxicity. And that's kind of, of that. And I'm going to go real quick in a couple of case histories. This is a 52-year-old male with multiple sclerosis, diagnosed in 1995, wheelchair bound. Initial assessment is 25D was 79, is 125 was 120. Interestingly enough, he had an IgG antibody level of 1 to 320 for Bartonella henseli. And we initiated the, the therapy so that roughly a year and a half later, um, he was on full dose of minocycline clindamycin and his, his 25D was now into 50 and his reduction of his 125. And his Bartonella level is 1 to 64. Um, we then continued the protocol over that period of time. He had a significant uh, reduced 25D at that time, but at the same time clinically he was better. And then we checked him again in 07. He was starting to go to a more normal pattern of 25D and 125D, and which has persisted. Second case is a 30-year-old chronic fatigue, with female chronic fatigue for six years, positive ANA at Mayo Clinic. She was also positive uh, for IgM Western blot Borrelia. Um, again, you'll see that her 25D was not below 50. She was 94. She had a 160, a 125. She also had a, uh, evidence of being exposed to rickettsia with no past history of rickettsial infection. Um, and she then started to see the same pattern of 25 going towards a certain 50 to 60 pattern and the 125 dropping below 110. Um, and now this is where what is interesting in 08 is that she was continuing to improve from her symptom, symptom wise but her 125 all of a sudden shot up to 200 and this is an expression of this delayed ex, um, uh, increased immune response that we can characterize as a, similar to an iris pattern uh, but she became a negative. Then the last one is chronic fatigue syndrome. This one I just want to identify in terms of the questioning 25D levels as being an assumption of vitamin D storage. We assessed her in August of 07. Her 25D level was 138 nanomoles per liter. She had elevated CRP, she had an elevated ferritin, and she had an elevated IgG for anaplasma. Then in December 2007, no therapy initiated. She was down to 96, 130, still elevated therapy. Then we initiated Olmosartan only, and there her 25D was now down to 65. So um, basically, this is what we've observed with Olmosartan alone. We have pretty reliable reduction in 125 levels. We have improved symptomatology within with 50% of patients. We have increased symptoms with a 10%. Then when we add the antibiotics, we get a s aggravation of symptoms through immunopathological response and then later increased inflammatory response. But as treatments progressed, the vitamin D metabolites would tend to normalize down to 25D between 50 and 70 and 125 between 50 and 90. So in summary, as I say, 125 vitamin D is a sensitive clinical marker for autoimmune and chronic disease and reflects parainflammation and VDR hyperresponsiveness. This parainflammation could be due to persistent bacterial infection, both because of what I found serologically and, as, and also what we found in response to antibacterial medication. Pro-inflammatory cytokines can be safely reduced with ARBs. sub levels of bacterial antibiotic, antibiotics are effective in reducing bacterial burden. And finally, resolution of the inflammatory condition is reflected in the normalization of vitamin D metabolites. Thank you. Thank you.